Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. I hope you came thirsty because I'm gonna be pouring shots in a moment, and that would be shots of whiskey. Because we're doing the Whiskey Rebellion. That's right, George Washington, 1791 to 1794, a defining event in American history. Giddy up for the learning. I hope you're ready to do it because here we go. Bartender, start pouring. big ideas first guys and the big idea behind the whiskey rebellion is going to be federal government strength I'll even start adopting the middle name Schwarzenegger for uh, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton during this lecture because that's the major concept that the supremacy clause article 6 of the Constitution that says the Constitution is the law of the land those are only words it's like a tiger with no teeth so what the whiskey rebellion is going to do is put some teeth into that tiger so once and for all we know that the federal government has these powers that are delegated in the Constitution, and as they say in the street, they are for real. So if I let it slip and I say, who's your daddy? By the end of this lecture, we're all gonna be able to answer the central government. Don't forget, we still have a Tenth Amendment though. All right, so we're not gonna get too far into the weeds with the details. You certainly could write a research paper on the Whiskey Rebellion. We don't need to know all the names. But the basic plot here is that in 1791, um, under the advisement of Alexander Hamilton, Congress passed something called the Whiskey Tax. And what the whiskey tax did was, obviously, it's going to put a sales tax on whiskey. But the reason for it was to pay down this new national debt that was adopted by Congress in 1790. You have to remember that uh, Alexander Schwarzenegger Hamilton is really kind of garnering strength for the central government with these economic programs. Remember, he's the father of the National Bank. He's a big advocate of tariffs and kind of increasing revenue by, you know, taxing the French underwear. That is a tax on the French underwear to get you to buy American underwear so we can help U.S. manufacturers. He sees himself, in a, in a sense, or the central government as having this type of kind of, you know, hand on the lever of the economy, let's put it that way. And certainly by 1790, by assuming state debt into a national debt, I believe the state debt ran upwards of 25 million. There's an article of confederation debt of 50 million. So we're a strapping young nation with 75 million of debt on our back. And Hamilton's looking for a way to raise Momo to raise some money, baby, and the tariffs aren't, um, you know, doing it enough. So he recommends that they tax whiskey. Why whiskey? I don't know. Maybe he drank rum. There we go. We have whiskey tax right now. All we have to do is enforce it. Washington cuts up the country into districts. He gives different districts to different dudes. And now we're going to go collect the money. All right, before we start throwing rocks, let's understand kind of the basic motives of the rock throwers. Why are they so upset? Well, number one, they're upset because they see themselves disconnected from the Union. They're out in the western part of the country. They don't see their interests like navigational control over the Mississippi River or a Native American problem in their eyes as being top of the agenda. So in a sense, they see as their representation really isn't being heard. And remember, that's the mantra of the revolution, no taxation without representation. And you also have to remember that whiskey is very important to their livelihood, not only as a luxury, but also as a source of cash, as a, as a bartering or trading mechanism. So when you are taxing whiskey, in a sense, you are taxing their income. Um, and I also think that there was a problem because of the way that the tax law was written. Um, and what it basically did was it gave the whiskey distiller um, a chance to either pay a flat fee or to pay by a gallon. And the Eastern establishment, and certainly the richer distilleries in Western Pennsylvania, they could afford the flat fee and therefore it made it cheaper for them to produce more whiskey at least in competition to the smaller person who is doing it by gallon and it's costing them a lot more money so again I think it's this idea of the establishment versus the farmer the small guy and they're also upset of why the tax is coming up in the first place you know this policy of assumption of the national government assuming state debt seemed fundamentally unfair to the western part of Pennsylvania who saw the that, you know, we were really taking on debt for states that didn't pay their own debt. Why should I have to pay a sales tax to pay down a debt that that guy created over there? Now we got some rock throwers. Are you ready to throw some rocks to throw with the Mississippi River? 
right, so in 1792, there's two um, different conventions that occur in Western Pennsylvania that are basically designed to express the popular opinion of the, of the day. The first one is seen more as a kind of a moderate expression of the, of the anger because they were basically conventions that were run by moderates. Uh, Hugh Henry Breckinridge and William Finley. William Finley was a, a congressman from Western Pennsylvania. And basically he's saying, yo, chill, Pete. We can do this, we can petition the government, and the government even lowers the tax by a penny, but that didn't really do too much. And then um, in August of uh, 1792, there was an association called the Mingo Creek Association that starts to form basically the hotheads of the, of the uh, public, the people that are you know, really wanting to fight back, the ones that are feeling the spirit of the Revolutionary War. They're putting up liberty polls, kind of warning tax collectors, you better be careful because, uh, you know, you messing in my hood. And then in, uh, would it be uh, September 11th? I always remember it was September 11th because of obviously 9-11 being a big day. That's the first terrorist act. The first terrorist act in American history is on 9-11-1792 against a tax collector called Robert Johnson who is attacked by one of these Mingo Creek mobs. And they tar and feather him and they kind of beat the nonsense out of him and then they kind of kick him home. And now we basically have the beginning of, you know, a problem. That there is actual violence. It's not just petitioning and conventions. That's kind of the way we do things in America today. It's, the, you know, kind of petitioning through billy clubs and pain and violence. So the federal government's ears perk up and uh, so begins the beginning of the Whiskey Rebellion. Drinky, drinky. My muscles. So 1793 is the beginning of the conflict, and the beginning of the conflict is really going to be the Mingo Creek Association, which is kind of the uh, force of resistance. You see how I use a French Revolution accent? Because I want you to kind of think of this as kind of like, you know, uh, mirroring the French Revolution in terms of the, 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 the mob mentality, that this is us versus them. Um, the tax collector, General John Neville, is seen really as somebody who's profiting off this, somebody who's a large landowner, somebody who might live in western Pennsylvania but his roots are on the eastern coast and he's not to be trusted and the Mingo Creek Association is almost acting kind of like the mafia, controlling businesses and people by saying look you don't pay the tax, don't deal with this guy because if you do I'm not saying what's going to happen, but you know. And really, the tax is not getting collected. So uh, this goes on for a while in the beginning of 1793, and then really the Mingo Creek Association is going to take it to the next level in June of 1793 when a mob of 100 people in Washington County, this is western Pennsylvania, burns an effigy of General John Neville. And now we have what looks like a revolution. And then a couple months later, in September of 1793, a mob breaks into Benjamin Wells, the tax collector of Washington County, and at gunpoint they force him to give up his commission. And now the power is in the people's hands. That might have been a Russian accent. That's terrible. But now we've pissed off George Washington. Climax time. In 1794, in May, 60 subpoenas are issued for the arrest of these distillers that aren't paying their taxes. And it was George Neville himself, the guy in charge of collecting the taxes, that went down into the hood and was accompanying the, uh, the officers that were arresting these guys when shots were fired basically over their heads as a warning sign. This was probably the Mingo Creek Association. This was on July 15th. So George Neville ends up going back to uh, what was called Bower Hill. This is kind of his compound in western Pennsylvania. And by July 16th, you have 500, 600 rebels that have surrounded his house. And they were led by a former revolutionary major named James McFarlane. And James McFarlane is kind of seen as this kind of heroic guy, and he's standing up for these rebels that are standing on the principles of Jeffersonian, you know, democracy and fighting the tyranny of the central government. And U.S. Major Abraham Kirkpatrick was sent out to defend the house of George Neville. So here we have a little brouhaha. And on July 17th, um, they, I, I believe the story goes that somebody in the house had supposedly kind of raised a white flag. And it was um, James McFarlane who called a ceasefire. This was the, the rebel general. And when he stepped out into the open field, somebody sniped him from inside the house. 
So on July 18th, the rebels hold the funeral for General James McFarlane, who was killed the day before. And at that funeral, kind of like, you know, anger rises to the next level. Um, David Bradford becomes one of the leaders of the rebel groups at this point, and he's calling for heads to roll. He's calling for the guillotine. So after the funeral, David Braddock organizes a huge kind of like rebel show of strength on Braddock's Field. This happens on August 1st of 1794, and they get 7,000, 7,000 people, and David Bradford's like Rospeer, man, of the French Revolution. He's screaming for bloody murder. They're ready to march on Pittsburgh. They're going to burn down the houses of the wealthy. You know, voices of moderation are being drowned out by the radicalness, and this really is the Tipping point. Now they gone done it. They made George mad. And a couple days later, I believe on August 4th of 1794, Washington gets one of the Supreme Court justices to declare Western Pennsylvania to be in a state of rebellion. And this gives him executive power to kind of call up the militia to crush the rebellion. He gets 13,000 from four states like New Jersey, Virginia, Pennsylvania. I'm gonna, not going to name the other one, I'm going to say Maryland. And uh, they actually instituted the draft for this, the first time the draft was used um, after the Revolutionary War. And it's actually the first and the last time that a sitting president will actually lead the army in battle, in a war. And that's Washington himself meeting up with the troops and kind of leading the troops into western Pennsylvania. But there ain't no fight. There ain't no fight because they all ran. They ended up getting a couple guys arrested for treason. They were sentenced to death. Washington pardoned them. But that's not the concept of this lecture. The concept isn't what happened to the bad guys. The concept isn't like 13,000. The concept is now the supremacy clause means business. Now in federalism, we have something called sovereignty of the national government, that the people and their collective will can only be expressed through constitutional mechanisms. We're not going to have any more of these Shays rebellions. No more of these whiskey rebellions. If you don't like something, then you should vote for something different. And that's the concept. So there you go. Now you know who your daddy is, right? Your daddy is the federal government. Unless you're libertarian and then your daddy's yourself, I guess. Unless you maybe like the Tenth Amendment a lot and the state's your daddy. Or maybe your daddy's just your dad. I don't know. Make sure you check out other videos, guys. If you click my face, you can subscribe to Hip Hughes History. It's free and it's fun and we're focused on learning. Uh, giddy up, there you go. We'll see you next time.